This week we have been studying the book of Hebrews. And I hope that two things have happened simultaneously. Not only have you learned some new things about the situation on the ground in A.D. 64, and you have a good pair of A.D. 64 sandals to stand in so that you can appreciate what is being said and under the circumstances for which it's said. You know, one of the biggest problems with Bible study that many, many wonderful Christians overlook is that you have to examine what is said and to whom it's said and the circumstances in which it's said. Um, for example, let me just use a quick example. Um, here in 1 Peter 4.7, Peter wrote this sometime probably around... 80, 85 A.D. And uh, it was his impression that the end of all things is near. You remember on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and said, Men and brethren, we're not drunk. No, these men are filled with the Spirit, just as the prophet Joel predicted. In the last days, God is going to pour out His Spirit. You know that in Acts chapter 2. Well, this was Peter's understanding of the time in which he lived. When he wrote, the end of all things is near. And so, down through the 2,000 years since Peter wrote this, we've had a problem of wolf, wolf. The end is near. The end is near. The end is near. And after a while, it becomes meaningless. It just becomes an expression with no meaning. How do we know? How can you say the end is near if you don't know where the end is? Right? When the Lord called me to begin teaching and speaking on the book of Revelation primarily, um, I said to the Lord, Lord, history says that everyone who declares your coming is soon, they all die. The Lord said, what's that to you, Larry? <laughs> they shall all live. I just had a change of attitude, Lord. I had a salvific moment. Will you go and do what I've asked you to do, Larry? Or will you not? Hmm. Yes, Lord, I'll go. But I wasn't that, it didn't take, it took about a year for me to reach the point to leave my employment, leave my colleagues, leave my friends, leave my job, leave my, you know, fortunately not my family, but everything else. It took a year to come to that point and finally, the decision was made, and you know, I have not one regret. I lost one family after 17 years and gained another, and I, I have not one regret. And this is the experience Paul is trying to pull the Hebrews into, that if you will live by faith, if you will walk with the Lord, if you will come out of this restraint that Judaism has put you in, you won't look back once you have made the decision and seen the joy of the Lord. We've been talking this week about five atomic bombs. 
that the Apostle Paul creates in the book of Hebrews. And each bomb, if you will, is designed to shatter and destroy the whole framework and structure of Judaism. What Paul is trying to do, he's trying to extract believers in Christ out of Judaism. And that is a most difficult thing to do. We've been, last night in this particular study, we're talking about the fourth atomic bomb. And that is that just because your great granddaddy was Abraham, that doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. And that is a most difficult concept for Jews to accept. Because the promise of the land and of the kingdom of God was given unilaterally to Abraham. And so if you want to receive and participate the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, you've got to be a descendant of Abraham. Because all, no, one, no one else is going to be a part in that kingdom. Christians today don't think like this very often. We, Christians today don't talk much about the unilateral promise made to Abraham because they simply don't understand it. And, and, and their whole prophetic schematics get all messed up, weaving plan A into plan B, and it, it just becomes a nightmare. And there's so much confusion, you, you can hardly figure your way out of it. So last night, if you remember, we talked about how God made a blood covenant, a unilateral covenant with Abraham, one-sided. And he said, Abraham, the land that I'm calling you to, I'm going to give it to you and your descendants forever. Now, it wasn't just a piece of dirt that God had in mind. You remember that? How many of you have instant recalls working this morning? I'm glad to see that. It's encouraging. Encouraging. So, the Lord made a promise to Abraham that is unilateral. And that promise still stands. And this is why it is so important to be in Christ because the only way to participate in the promise given to Abraham is now through Christ. Does that make sense? About 400 years after making the covenant with Abraham, God asked Abraham's descendants at Mount Sinai if they wanted to serve as the trustees of the gospel. Remember, the plan of salvation is a living trust. And there's a benefactor, there's a trustee, and there's beneficiaries. And so God's looking for some trustees. He wants some people to go out into the world and to share the good news of the gospel. These are often called the elect. They're sometimes called the chosen. They're called by different names, but basically it's always the same thing. It's the trustee who takes the riches of the benefactor and distributes it to the beneficiaries. So the job of the trustee is a little more involved than, than the, what goes on with the beneficiaries. You understand the three parties of a living trust. The benefactor, he can't be here because of sin. We are separated from God because of sin. So he appoints some trustees to distribute the riches of his grace and the gospel and the good news and the more abundant life to the, his beneficiaries, who is the world. For God so loved the world. Three parties involved. The Lord wanted to use Abraham's offspring as trustees of the gospel. And 400 years later, after making the covenant with Abraham, 
God sent Moses down the mountain to say the following words to Israel. I'm just kind of reviewing where we left off last night. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, I'm separating you from everybody else. You will be my treasured possession. Not because I don't love the others the same, but because I need trustees. I need some teachers. I need some priests. I need some arms and legs to go throughout the earth to represent me. Look, I love you just like I love everybody else. God is no respecter of persons. I made all of you, he says. But I'm choosing, I need some helpers. And I'm going to bless the helpers in a very special ways so that they can take those blessings and share them with others and be trustees of my riches. But what happens when the trustees steal all the benefactors' riches? The beneficiaries get nothing. What is more disgusting than to find that a trustee has stolen all that was intended for the beneficiary? History is replete with stories of where trust people in positions of trust have been so selfish and so greedy and so sick that they would steal from the beneficiaries and keep what was supposed to pass through their hands. That's exactly what Israel did. Israel locked itself up in a little city. It ate Jerusalem food, had Jerusalem friends, and only talked to the, to Jer the citizens of Jerusalem. They saw themselves a treasured possession because our daddy's Abraham. Totally missed the point. Totally missed the point. God is trying to... He, God, if, isn't it a funny thing about this? God knows exactly what's going to happen before he even gets going with it, but he does it anyway. When he delivered Israel out of Egypt... He knew, he knew that only two of them would enter the promised land. <laughs> and he did it anyway. God is the only parent who would send a kid to college and pay $100,000 in tuition knowing in advance the kid is going to fail. <laughs> what, kind of a, what kind of love is that? God treats us on the basis of love, not on the basis of foreknowledge. That's so, that's so wonderful. He treats us on the basis of his enduring and everlasting love without regard in his foreknowledge, knowing how the end is going to turn out. And that's one of the most fascinating stories and why the book of life is sealed up with seven seals. How he wrote it all down, sealed it up, and at the end of the thousand years, it'll be broken open, the last and seventh seal, and then everything that God foreknew will then be revealed and compared with what was actually recorded in real time. And the two records will turn out to be identical. And what will God prove? He will prove that his foreknowledge does, has no effect on his love. And that's so unlike me. <laughs> right? That's so unlike the human condition. We depend on our foreknowledge to avoid disaster, but not God. No. Not, not God. God is not, he's, he, he will take on any disaster. He will take on any lemon and make lemonade out of it. That is what's so neat about the God we serve. So he said to Israel, If you will obey me fully and keep my commandment, 
excuse me, covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, I'm looking for some go-betweens. That's what a priest is, an intercessor, a, a, a mediator, someone in between God, the benefactor, and the beneficiary. That's what a priest is. That's a trustee. And these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. All right. A bilateral covenant occurs when two or more parties agree to do something. I sell, will sell you my bowl for one dollar. And you agree to do that, and we have a bilateral co you know, covenant agreement. And you produce, you lay your dollar on the table, and I hand you the bowl. Israel made, entered into a bilateral covenant and said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. And remember, the covenant between God and Abraham, though, is not bilateral. It's only one-sided. Abraham I am going to give to you and your, your descendants after you this land. Unilateral. It's not dependent upon the behavior of your offspring. I'm going to do it. And Israel said, Exodus 19.8, We will do everything the Lord has said. And Moses brought their answer to the Lord. Israel agreed to a covenant that is impossible, though, for the carnal nature to keep. That's the problem. Within 40 days, Israel was worshiping a golden calf. Can you imagine, after having seen Mount Sinai quiver and tremble with the grandeur and the greatness and the authority and majesty of God Almighty, and the whole top of the mountain is burning on fire, and camped at the foot of that mountain, they build an altar and worship a golden calf. How, how is that possible in just 40 days? It's astonishing what the carnal nature is all about, isn't it? Paul wrote in Hebrews 8, 7, For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, there would have been no need for another covenant. But God found fault with the people. Naturally. <laughs> no fault with God. It's always us. And so he said, God said, The time is coming. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. A new covenant. Now if the descendants of Abraham had experienced rebirth as individuals, if they had become teachable and humble in heart, the salt of the earth, a light upon a hill, if Israel had allowed the light of truth to shine through them, Think of the thousands of Gentiles who would have become Israelites. I'm sorry, I just like that so well. <laughs> but God's higher demands did not bring Israel into submission. In fact, it pushed them into deeper rebellion. So at the corporate level, now this may, think about this for a minute. Think, you've got to look at Israel on two levels. Here's the family as a unit, and here are the individuals within the unit. So if we talk about the church at Round Rock called Round Rock Faith Fellowship, we talk corporately about the church group. Now, if we talk about Aiden and Heidi, we're talking about two members within the group. Well, Israel has a corporate setting. Israel has an individual setting. And as the individual setting, if the individuals are in rebellion, what will be the corporate condition? 
rebellion. If the individuals have the born again experience, what will be the corporate identity of the body of Israel? A born again group, a nation, a nation of priests, trustees of the living God. How can you, how can God have a trustee who is in rebellion to God? That, that won't work at all. So at the corporate level, we see that God planned to use the natural descendants of Abraham, his family, to accomplish a great deal of good on earth, and this good would have created a body of people who love God and cherish righteousness, and within this atmosphere, a nation of born-again people, Jesus would have come down and established the kingdom of God in Canaan. I'm going to show you that from the Bible in a second in the, in the service that follows today. So let's look at the descendants of Abraham as individuals. If a Gentile, now remember a Gentile, is the, the, the word Gentile comes from the, the root word which just simply means Grecian. If a Greek wants to become a descendant of Abraham. The word Gentile comes just from the identity, and it later just came to mean anyone who is non-Jew. Anyone not related to Abraham. If your daddy is an Abraham, you be Gentile. <laughs> so, if a Gentile wanted to become a descendant of Abraham so that he might share in the unilateral promise given to Abraham... And if he wanted to participate in the God's bilateral covenant given to Abraham's descendants, how could this happen? Was, what's the doorway into Judaism? What's the doorway to becoming a descendant of Abraham? Because only the descendants of Abraham are going to get the land. Okay? The way into Abraham's bosom, if you will, was through water and the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit brings a person to the realization that he will not have a place in the kingdom of God unless he repents of his rebellion and goes in a different direction, a salvific taste test occurs. This only occurs, though, when the Holy Spirit brings that conviction. And that's why preaching, Paul calls it the foolishness of preaching, is important. Because it's when the word is spoken, it's when the word is proclaimed, that the Holy Spirit has a chance to take a hammer and nail and drive the words into the heart. And that's why God has ordained apostles, pastors, teachers, prophets, whatever, as, as servants of the church so that as they promote the gospel, the Holy Spirit has an external way of getting attention so that he might pound on people's hearts. When the Holy Spirit brings a person to the realization he will not have a place in the kingdom of God unless he repents of his rebellion and goes in a different direction, a salvific test. What, what, do I, what do I mean by salvific? His salvation is at stake. You, you either rebel or you surrender when a salvific test occurs. There's no middle ground. If you ask a young lady to marry you and, she's, and, and, and she doesn't give you an answer. What have you just heard? No. <laughs> Anything less than yes is no, is it not? <laughs> I'm saying that for Chris and Lex's sake. They were married last August. <laughs> Anything less than yes. I remember coming home from school when I was in about the fifth grade. And my mother told me, 
that if I didn't pass my English test, she was going to give me a spanking. Well, I failed. And I remember going home that afternoon, and I said, Mom, she said, how did you do on your test? I said, Mom, I almost passed. <laughs> I'm trying to put it in the most positive light that I can. But almost is not enough. King Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. But anything short of surrender is rebellion. That's what a salvific test is. When the Holy Spirit brings a sinner to a place where the sinner realizes his true condition before God, the sinner will either quit doing what he has been doing, or he will only strengthen his rebellion against God. You see, living by faith is very difficult because Holy Spirit conviction always runs contrary to our carnal desires. You ever notice that? I rarely find myself in alignment with the Holy Spirit until he clocks me. And then I have a salvific test and he brings me back into the walk that I need to be walking. And I have really bad news. You know, preachers love the idea that the gospel is good news. Well, I have bad news. I have bad news. The Holy Spirit is constantly creating new convictions to see if we will go forward or if we will plateau out in defiance. That is really bad news. If you've walked with the Lord any time at all, you know what I'm saying is true. The Holy Spirit never lets up. Never. Constantly creating new convictions to see if we will go forward or if we'll plateau out in defiance. When a sinner lives a life of faith following the, as the Spirit leads, he will never reach perfection. I'll speak more about that this afternoon. There is a perfection coming, but it will come as a gift from God after having passed the final salvific test. The righteousness of Christ is going to be imparted to every sinner during the Great Tribulation, during the judgment of the living, during the 1260 days allotted to the two witnesses. God is going to take away the carnal nature, fill us with the righteousness of Christ, close the door and seal it. And this is called the sealing. Until that happens, the Holy Spirit will never stop creating new tests of faith and we will never reach perfection. We keep growing, we keep going, but the perfection to which God calls us is not possible unless there is a miracle in our lives. Thus, the sinner is constantly cleaning up the messes on aisle three. The messes that he has made or is making, therefore humility and restitution become indispensable. It is so humbling to have to say, I'm sorry, I made a big mistake. I opened my big mouth when I should not have. I said things that were unkind and I truly regret it. I did something I shouldn't have done and I'm very sorry. That never ends. If you don't remember doing that at some time in recent history, you might check your recent history and see where you are. 
Because it is the Holy Spirit that takes us from one faith challenge to the next faith challenge. And these challenges are always, always humbling and humiliating. But that's what it takes to grow. That's what it takes to be transformed. That's what it takes to be changed into the likeness of Christ. I remember years ago, Levy and I were talking one day about Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. And Letty was trying, I had not read the book at that time, and Letty was trying to tell me what it was all about. And one of the first things that came out of her mouth was, she says, well, she, what you, to, to live the purpose-driven life, you've got to be willing to, to change and, and, to, and to allow God to bring forth the purpose for which he created you. And I remember saying to Letty, but change is not something that I want. I'm pretty happy the way I am. <laughs> and she said, well, then the purpose that God has for you will never be fulfilled. I said, never? She said, never. You've got to change. You've got to grow in Christ in order for his purposes to unfold. And if you're unwilling to change, if you're unwilling to be transformed, how can, how can the purpose unfold? Living by faith is a struggle. Holy Spirit conviction irritates the carnal nature. And when a person knows experientially what living by faith is all about, guess what? He wants to be with others who are like-minded. It was God's plan that Israel would be a family of people understanding what faith was all about. And as it turned out, Israel was a family never understanding what rebellion was all about. As trustees of the gospel, Israel failed miserably. Get this, then God assigned Christians as trustees. And they failed miserably. Then God rose up some Protestants as trustees. And they failed and have failed miserably. And finally, this is why in the book of Revelation, God is going to have 144,000 trustees at the end who will accomplish what Christians have been unable to do and Israel was unable to do over the past 3,500 years. The riches of God's grace are going to be distributed to his beneficiaries through the 144,000. And what's really cool about the success, the 144,000 are not going to fail because before they begin their work, you know what God does to them? He takes out the carnal nature and seals them first. That's why they're called first fruits. That happens to them first. So we're going to have basically something not seen on earth since Jesus was here. Human beings without a sinful nature. Whoa. That's going to be awesome to see. How they live, how they speak, what they do. No wonder they're going to be a special group of people to Jesus throughout eternity. Okay, back to the question. I'm worse than Paul at going around Fort Worth to get to the point. What was supposed to happen if a Gentile heard the gospel of Jesus and he wanted to participate in the unilateral promise made to Abraham and the bilateral promises made to the trustees, the descendants of Abraham. This is where baptism comes in. Remember, to be valid, a covenant has to have a sign, a pledge, or consideration of some kind. So when the Holy Spirit brings a person to a point in his life where he wants to become a part of the family of God, that is, become a trustee, Two things usually happen. First, the sinner needs to have a clarifying moment 
a public declaration before witnesses indicating that he has stepped over the line and chosen to follow Christ and exalt the teachings and the way of Christ in his life. Why is this declaration important? It's important that pastors and teachers bring people to make this declaration because then, once you've made it, and witnesses have seen and testified to your declaration, you have a starting point. You have a point of reference. You know now who you are. You've made a declaration of who you are. And as you run into conflict with your friends, and you will, you have a reason to tell them, I've changed. I've given my life to Christ. I now am a disciple of Jesus, and I don't do those things anymore. And they will say, you're crazy. They will say, you're nuts. They will ridicule you. They will scorn you. They will think you're just, and that ends the friendship. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No. No. How can you have one foot in the world and one foot with it walking with the Lord? If you're walking with the world, you're going that way. If you're walking with the Lord, you're going that way. Something's got to give. <laughs> and second, there is a sign indicating that the sinner has chosen to become a disciple of Jesus and it is baptism by water. Baptism represents, I love this, drowning the carnal man and coming up from the grave as a new man. Go down in the water, hold the victim there for a couple of minutes, <laughs> drown the carnal nature, the carnal man, and bring him up to a new life. Did you know that in Israel, when a Gentile came into Israel and wanted to participate in, in the co covenant made to Abraham and then the bilateral covenants between God and Israel, that the, day, the date of baptism was the birthday in Israel. You could be 40 years old, but your birthday began the day you were baptized into Israel. Your previous 40 years didn't count. Nothing. You were dead. You were dead for 40 years before you came alive. And so you're on the rolls, on your driver's license, your birthday. You might be, might be 70 years old. But on your, your driver's license would say you were 16. Because that's when you were baptized. Paul says in Romans 6, 3, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? There, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The reason I'm talking about baptism is that you have to understand in A.D., 64, what had happened a little earlier, John the Baptist came to, into the Jordan, region of the Jordan River, and was baptizing when Jesus began his ministry. John was preaching and baptizing those who wanted to be a part of the kingdom of God, yes, which was about to begin. It was God's intention to establish the kingdom of God when Jesus came to earth. And in the 70th week, the, the commencement of the kingdom of God was going to begin if Israel would receive Messiah. So the Lord sends John ahead of Jesus to begin preaching about the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 1, verse 2. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance 
for the forgiveness of sins. What John is saying to Israel is that the kingdom of God is, okay, this man shows up out at the Jordan River. Not just any man, a, a, a man called by God. And the people would go out to hear him, and the Holy Spirit would take the words of John and really hammer on the people's hearts. And John convinced many, many, many people that if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, you've got to be, your sins have got to be forgiven. And you've got to be baptized into a baptism of repentance and, re and put aside your rebellion and become born again. Okay? After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, not far, you know, from the river, proclaiming the good news of God. Watch the words of Jesus in Mark 1.15. Jesus said, The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Plan A was still possible in Mark 1. Jesus himself, the kingdom of God is near. Repent, as John has said. Be born again. Repent of your rebellion. Be sorry for the rebellion that's within you. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a new heart and to create a new spirit within you. So what was promised? And to whom was it promised? Remember the two questions we had last night? Oops. What was promised? The land. To whom was it promised? The descendants of Abraham. But now we have a few qualifiers, don't we? We know it's not just the 20,000 square miles called Canaan. You know, 200 by 100. And we know it's just not the biological offspring to whom it's promised. We've modified this a little bit. John was offering a baptism of repentance at the Jordan River because John understood that entrance into God's kingdom was not a biological matter. Ah. John's words terrified his listeners. The Holy Spirit gave his words penetrating power. These weren't fluffy preacher words. These were heavy words, and it pounded in the hearts of those who listened. John's words were convicting. John said no one was going to enter the kingdom of God because he was merely a descendant of Abraham. Well, a lot of Jews believed that, hmm, okay, so the kingdom of God is coming, and you've got to be baptized to be a member of it. I think I'll go get baptized. You know, that's the, that's the deal behind curtain three. That's the big deal of the day. The kingdom of God is coming, and if you want to be in it, you've got to get baptized. And their argument was, so what? If the kingdom of God doesn't come, what have you lost? You know, so step right up, folks. Get your baptism here today. Fifty cents, please. All these crowds were coming out to be baptized by John, and notice his kind words. <laughs> you brood of vipers! You den of snakes! You gotta have some sandals to understand the setting why John would say this. He saw that all these people came out wanting to be immersed, but not wanting to be born again. Not wanting to put away their rebellion. The carnal nature wants salvation without a cross. The cross is painful. Dying on the cross is painful. The carnal nature is an amazing thing. It's, who can understand it? Paul writes in Romans 7, the things I would do, I don't do. The things I would not do, I do. John knew 
that the bandwagon had started and people were coming to get baptized, not because they were sorry and repentant, but because they wanted the ritual to get into the kingdom. And this is why he was so adamant. You brood of vipers. You, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Part of John's message was, if you aren't part of the kingdom of God, you're going to be burned up. Well, if you want to escape hell, get in the water. You know, that's the way, that's the way it works. John says, look, uh, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Ab Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. See, the Jews had the understanding that because of the promises made to Abraham and they were descendants of Abraham, they were going to get what was promised to Abraham. And this is where John is showing clearly in the New Testament that being a descendant of Abraham has nothing to do with eternal life. It doesn't. God has no grandchildren. Every child of God is born again as a son or daughter of God. Who your parents were is immaterial to God. Matters no, is nothing, means nothing. All that matters is whether you are a child of God. John claimed those entering the kingdom of God had to repent and receive a heart like Abraham, and this was only possible through the Spirit of God. Years later, Paul summed up this matter very well. A man is not a Jew, that is, the offspring of Abraham, if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Jesus told Nicodemus, I tell you the truth. This is a timeless truth, which the offspring of Abraham do not know. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Look at the words of Jesus, and you will understand why the kingdom of God could not be established on earth in five separate tribes. So, in closing, there's this segment. What was the big bomb? What is Paul's fourth bomb? What is he trying to get the wavering Hebrews to understand? That the covenant made with Abraham does not necessarily include all Jews. That is huge to the Jewish mind. To the Messianic Jew, that's still huge. To the Orthodox Jew today, that is enormously huge. And you know, to the Roman Catholic, this is still very important. Because the Roman Catholic Church teaches that it is the only true church. And if you want to participate in salvation, you must be a member of the true church. The only church, the Church of Christ. But being a member of any organization, even Israel, is meaningless when it comes to salvation. God found fault, Hebrews 8.8, 8, with our forefathers. The people who could not live according to the covenant, and God said, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Carefully watch this. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. 
because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. In Ezekiel 23, you can see how Israel wandered away from the Lord. But this is the covenant. Now, watch this. Paul is going to put this in future tense. He's going to take what is said back in the days of Jeremiah. He's quoting here from Jeremiah. He's going to take what is said back around seven, um, excuse me, in the seventh century B.C., and he's going to use it right now to indicate that it's about to happen because Paul believes that the return of Jesus is about to happen like Peter and the other apostles. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. There's this, we'll talk about this time later, declares the Lord. God says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. What is, what, what is this covenant here actually saying? It says there's no carnal nature involved. The sealing, that's right. This is a covenant. This is the new covenant that Paul is speaking about that God is going to make with the house of Israel. Now, who is, who is Israel today? Believers in Christ. Galatians 3.29. If you are a believer in Christ, then you are an heir of Abraham. So that makes the new Israel today the born-again believers in Christ. And so what's going to happen to the born-again believers in Christ? A time is coming when God is going to change us and take out the rebellion that's naturally within us. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. You know, when we get to heaven... There will be no preachers. They're gone. Well, there may be preachers there, but they won't be working as preachers. Uh, that's why I got to get that straight. And when we get to heaven, there aren't going to be any lawyers. And when we get to heaven, there's not going to be any doctors. <laughs> A whole raft of professions are going to disappear when we get to heaven. There will be no evangelism. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, they will all know me. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling, notice how he puts this in the oncoming future in verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete in aging will soon disappear. It hasn't disappeared yet. The rebellion is still here. But it's coming. A day is coming. Those living by faith will participate in a new covenant someday. This new covenant promises the removal of the carnal nature. God's laws will be written in our hearts and minds. And we will naturally be in harmony with God. I like that. Rebellion will not be present. Those who live by faith will receive this promise regardless of lineage or genealogical history. Follow Christ. Believe in Him. Because if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heir, heirs of the promise. I don't have what is promised, but I'm going to get it if I'm faithful. And to whom is it promised? To all who will come and live by faith. Whosoever will may come and drink the water of life freely. Are you thirsty? I am. Would you stand for the benediction?
Dear Lord, thank you for the Apostle Paul, who so clearly and so eloquently takes a complex topic to show that it doesn't matter who our forefather may be. All that matters is who our father is. And we today dedicate ourselves to you that we might please you, that we might serve you, that we might walk with you listening to your Holy Spirit, that we might be transformed by you, that we might be your children, that we might receive what is promised, for it certainly is a glorious future. And as we look forward to that, as we anticipate that, we know because it's a blood covenant, you intend to fully keep your word. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer this morning. In your wonderful name we pray, Jesus. Amen.